All right, Psalm 91, verse 1. Are you ready? All right, go ahead and stand. We'll get into it today. Psalm 91, verse 1. Well, doesn't that look good? Ready for Christmas? Looks good. Julie did that. Come on, let's give her a hand. She does all of, all of her work on here and Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Thank you for that. Yes, she does. Come on. Here. I'll just say this. I couldn't do what I do if she didn't do what she was doing. We're a team. We've always been a team. And if it wasn't for you guys, I couldn't do what I do. I'd be preaching to an empty room. All right. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Let's read this together as a family. He who dwells in the shall abide. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence today. Lord, we're excited to get into your word. We ask, Lord, that you just begin to speak to each heart that's here, each person that's watching online. And Lord, do what only you can do. As I deliver what you've placed in my heart, I know it's going to go forth like an arrow, pierce each heart that's in this room, each person that's listening. And Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing. We, again, we celebrate 100 days of being sober. We praise you for that. Only you can do that. We thank you. And Lord, we're seeing signs, wonders, and miracles all the time. We're seeing or receiving testimonies of people getting healed. We thank you for that. So Father, we ask today that you would do what only you can do in this room. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. 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 You can be seated. So glad you're here today. We're going to continue our journey through Psalm 91. Have you been blessed? All right, so look at verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So today we're going to begin to get into the promises. We were going to do that last week, and the Lord spoke to me and said, look at David. So that's what we did. But I want you to see how he sets this up. He who dwells in the secret place or sits down or rests in the presence of God, that person shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's where the protection is. I want you to get this. The protection is in the presence of God. Have you ever seen a big brother come in, or maybe you've had an older brother, and the little brother was getting picked on, and he goes like this? Come on. You know what I'm talking about? He's in the shadow of the big brother. That's what this is like. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. The enemy's coming at you. God goes, Joe, get right back there. Come here. Are you seeing this? That's what he's talking about. That's how God is to the person who dwells in the secret place. The enemy has to come through God to get to you. Now let's go to verse 2. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Now God becomes more than a God who saved me from hell. He now becomes my refuge and my fortress. And out of this relationship now comes trust. And I want you to notice something. It says, I will say of the Lord... Say that with me. I will say of the Lord. This isn't just talking about saying it to ourselves, but it's actually talking to one another. I will say of the Lord. In other words, we need to be reminding each other that the Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my fortress, and I trust him. Everyone in this room has a ministry, and I believe part of your ministry is to encourage each other. Did you know that? We're supposed to be encouraging one another. I will say of the Lord. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. This is from the New Living Translation. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Encourage each other. This is, everybody has a ministry. You're supposed to be doing this. Encouraging one another, building each other up. When we leave here and we go out into the world and many of us go to work, what happens? We get torn down. You watch TV, you get torn down, right? So this is what the body of Christ is supposed to do. Encourage each other, build each other up just as you are already doing. So we're called to encourage one another. Part of that encouragement is reminding each other how big our God is. Amen? What is depression compared to our God? I want you to think, what is lack compared to God? He's big, right? What is sickness compared to God? Do you understand the power of your words? It says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He's my place of safety. He is my fortress. He has me surrounded. And I trust him. Look at the person next to you and tell them, God is my refuge. God is my fortress. To say, he's my God. And I trust him. Now as a family, let's say it like this. God is our refuge. God is our fortress. He's our God. And we trust him. 
The enemy cannot defeat a believer who keeps speaking the word of God. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Amen. Every time that you speak the word of God, your faith grows on the inside. Do you know when Jesus died on the cross? Do you know when? When he stopped talking. The moment he quit talking, that's when he, he, the Bible says he gave up the ghost. He talked to the thief on the cross, said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Every time that he was talking, he was releasing power, he was releasing authority. The only way that Jesus could die is for him to go. That's how powerful your words are. Somebody say amen. amen. Touch three people, tell them, keep talking, keep talking. You have to speak the word of God. Not while I'm preaching, wait till I'm done, then you can talk. I'm just kidding. I like an interactive church, don't you? That's awesome. So what I'm saying is keep talking, keep encouraging, keep building one another up and edifying each other. The enemy is trying to shut the mouth of the church right now. How many know that? So we have to keep talking. We need to keep speaking this in our homes as we walk around the house in front of our family. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He's my fortress, my deliverer, my way maker, my provision, my safety. He's our God and I trust him. Now I'm going to ask you to do something a little weird. Everybody stand up. The reason I do this is because even as a pastor, I I want to do this, and I want to walk around the house saying, he's my safety, he's my refuge, but you feel kind of weird, don't you? Because Sam would be on her phone and go, (laughs) actually, she would, she'd be like, that's my dad. (laughs) So we're going to practice today, is that all right? Just say this, say, he's my refuge. refuge. All right, we're going to change it, we're going to speak over our families, because you're in your house, all right? Get get real comfortable, move around a little bit, all right. Say, he's our refuge. He's our refuge. He's our fortress. He's our deliverer. He's our way maker. He's our provision. He's our safety. He's our God. And we trust him. All right, let's give him praise. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. Now you're all practiced up. When you go home, you can do that, all right? And nobody's going to look at you weird, right? All right. Let's go to verse 3. Psalm 91, verse 3. Just say it again. Say, he's my refuge. That's awesome. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. A fowler is a bird, but it's also the person who traps the birds, who goes after them, catches them. So I want to look at this a little differently than some people look at it. It says, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. There's two ways I believe we could look at this. Number one, God can keep us from getting caught by the enemy, right? He can deliver us from going through the problem. And that's where our faith should be, that he's going to deliver me and I'm not going to have to go through it. But the second way to look at it is to, to be delivered from the snare that might mean that I'm already in it. I want you to see this. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. That might mean that you're in the snare right now. Amen. You see that? And from the perilous pestilence. When we read this, we always go through it. and we're, He's going to deliver me so I don't get COVID or I don't get sick. I don't get a virus, right? Surely he shall deliver you from the snare That could mean that he's going to reach in and pull you out because you're already caught. Does that make sense? This means that he can deliver you from your enemies, those who wish you harm. It also means that he can deliver you from your own bad decisions that get you in the snare. The reason I wanted to point this out is surely he shall deliver you, you're already in it, is because some people, they, they want to use their faith and that's a good thing, but whenever they get sick, they feel like a failure. Are you with me? Have you ever felt like that? Here comes the guilt and the shame. I should have had enough faith not to get COVID. I should have had enough faith. I've been saying Psalm 91 and I turned around and got sick. Right? Surely he shall deliver you from the snare. So you might be in it, but he's still going to deliver you and pull you through. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's important to understand that. I might go through the fire, but he's going to deliver me from it. I may be in the trap, but he's going to deliver me from it. Amen? Amen. Because I don't want to, we cannot play the guilt and shame game. It's all on me. I didn't have enough faith. Have you ever felt like that? I didn't pray right, so I've got to figure out how to pray. So now I'm working a formula because I didn't put in the name of Jesus at the end of the prayer, and I'm trying to... Are you with me? All right. We're not religious, so I wanted to point that out. So God is going to deliver you no matter what. Somebody say amen. Amen. And from perilous pestilence, that's sickness and disease, that's the pandemic, you have to know that God will deliver you. Now this is how he does it, verse 4. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. And I want you to see this. Verse 1, he says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So that's the secret place. That's where we begin, alone with the Lord. Verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, 
My God in him I will trust. Now I'm speaking from experience from the secret place. From experience. He's my refuge. He's my fortress because I'm getting close to him. Now here comes the promises in verse 3. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. We just read that. But here's what I want you to see. Verse 4, he immediately takes us back into the secret place. So he gives us a couple promises. Then he goes, now in verse 4, we're back in. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Everybody say, that's the secret place. That's the secret place. That's where we find closeness and protection. So what I'm trying to, to do and trying my best over the last couple of weeks is to get into these promises, and it's more than just memorizing them. Because I know a lot of Christians who are walking around, I'm standing upon Psalm 91, but it's not in their heart. I'm not being critical or being mean, but it's not in there. Why? Because they're not dwelling in the secret place. It's that, de- that development, that relationship is developed in the secret place. Now I can walk out with confidence and say, he's going to cover me with his feathers. Under his wings, I'm going to take refuge. Why? Because I go there all the time in the secret place. Does that make sense? See, that intimacy builds my faith. Intimacy and relationship build my hope and my trust. Let's put it like this. Let's say someone wrote an article about you and submitted it to the newspaper. And when I read it, I feel like I'm getting to know you. I see your accomplishments. I see, I see what you've done. I'm reading all about you. But I, I real, if I really want to get to know you, I have to spend time with you. That's the way the Christian life is for a lot of people. I'm reading all about God. I'm learning about him. I come to church and I hear from Joe. He's telling me all about Jesus and what he's done for me. But in the secret place, I take what I'm learning and now I actually get to know this God. Does that make sense? So now I'm not just reading the newspaper about your life. I'm actually sitting down at Starbucks drinking a mocha talking to you. See the difference? All right. I want you to get that. Everybody say, that's the secret place. place. Now I know that God is protecting me, not because my pastor told me, but because I'm actually spending time with him. And then my faith grows, and these words begin to jump off the page, and not just ministering to my mind, but my heart. Now, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth begins to speak. Now I'm speaking faith. I'm speaking hope, because it's here. Amen? Amen. Psalm 91, verse 4. Let's look at it again. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. A buckler is a little shield that a soldier could wear on their forearm. So they'd have a big shield, but they'd also have a little round one. Have you seen that maybe with the Roman soldiers? And remember Ephesians 6 where it mentions the armor of God. It says, hold up the shield of faith, take the shield of faith. And Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. His truth shall be your shield and then the smaller shield, your buckler. When you know the truth of God's word, it is an ever-present shield in your life. It protects you. And the more I know the truth about who God is, who I am, and what he's given me, the stronger my faith becomes. And my faith becomes a shield. My belief system becomes a shield when the fiery darts of the wicked, he's shooting arrows at me, I actually put up the shield of faith and it blocks it. Do you see this? His truth shall be your shield. That's why we have to know the truth of God's word. When the doctor comes in and says, you have this or you have this going on, say, no, I stand upon the word of God. Because this is truth. Amen? Amen. When the enemy says, you're going to get a divorce, that your marriage can't be healed. No, this, this, says, this is all about restoring relationships, reconciliation. That's what this says. Right? right. Somebody just say amen real loud. Amen. amen. That helps me a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> Verses 5 and 6. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Everybody say, no fear. fear. When I'm living life from the secret place, I can live life without any fear. John 10.10. I want to show you something. Red letters. So who's saying this? The thief does not come except to what? And to? And to? I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I want you to see this because these are the characteristics of the enemy. He steals, he kills, he destroys. The reason I want you to see that is if anything comes into your life that steals, kills, and destroys, who sent it? The devil. 
then that means that God, if the devil has sent it, God has given you the power and the authority to fight it. I know this sounds basic here, but there's a lot of Christians that need to hear this. And I'm not being mean, I'm just being real with you. Is that cool? This is important because some people think that God makes people sick or gives them diseases. Does disease steal from your life? Does it kill? Does it destroy? Then how could God send it? It's that simple. It is that simple. Is something robbing from your finances? Stealing? Then how could that be God? Well, God's teaching me a lesson. God's taking me through this. The thief does not come except to what? Steal. And to, Steal. and to, destroy. if any of those things are happening in any area of your life, destroying a relationship, trying to kill something, steal from you, that's the enemy. It's that easy. Are you getting it this morning? Yeah. Now check out the other red letters. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The word abundant means existing or available in large quantities. Plentiful. That means that Jesus came to give us large quantities or plenty of joy, peace, health, love, blessings, prosperity, on and on. Large quantities. Did Jesus say more abundantly? Yep. That they may have it, what? More abundantly. Then why would we settle for less? Why would we ever, ever allow other Christians to try to talk us out of more abundantly? You serve a God of more than enough. How many stars are enough? How much ocean is enough? He created it all, right? How much universe is enough? How much space is enough? That's how generous he is. How many mountains are enough? He created all of it. You serve an exceedingly abundantly God. Look at Ephesians 3 verse 20. Now to him who is able to do what? Oh, come on, freedom. I hope I'm not preaching like that and it's rubbing off on you. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly. <laughs> Let's try. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly. There we go. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm back, baby. I'm back. Okay, that's what we need. <laughs> There's coffee in the bag if you guys need some today. <laughs> now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we what? We ask or think. Above the, what would we even ask him for? Because a lot of times we limit him. I'm not going to ask him for that. I just want to get by, right? All that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, according to the Holy Spirit, the power that's in you. It's not you. It's not your performance. It's not based upon what you've done. It's the power at work on the inside of you. Somebody say amen. amen. Exceeding means very great. Abundance, of course, abundant means large quantities or plenty. So Paul is letting us know that we serve a God of very great abundance. A God who is able to give you large quantities of great things. Everybody say plenty. plenty. Here's the issue. Some people's perception of God is a God of barely getting by. I've, I've talked to people and say, he meets my needs, but that's it. You have just shrunk God down to this size right here. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, it doesn't say now to him who is able to just barely meet my needs, barely pay my rent, make my house payment, barely get by, barely feed my family. No, it says to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything you would ask or even think. Just say, that's my God. That's my God. See, there's, there's one problem with people when they think small and they think that he can't do anything except meet your needs. The only problem is that's not what the Bible says. It's their own perception. If you see God as a God who can save but he can't heal, that's what you'll receive. If you see him as a God who can forgive sin but he can't bless me financially, that's what you'll receive. Your own perception of God could be holding you back from his blessings. I want you to get this. How you see God is what you will receive. If you see him as a God of more than enough, you'll receive more than enough. If you see him as a God who can heal my body, but he can't do anything with my finances, he might, you might get healed, but you're not going to be blessed financially. Why? It's, it's in your heart. Are you catching this? So how, my question to you is, how big is your God? How do you see your God? It's all your perception. Does this make sense? Yep. He big. That's right. <laughs> How you see God has everything to do with your relationship, which takes us back to the secret place. How do you see him? He's a God of more than enough. I want you to say this. Say, God loves me. God loves 
Now say this, say, God's got my back. back. See, you have to know this, and this confidence and knowing comes from the secret place. Psalm 91, verses 7 and 8. We're almost finished. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. You can be surrounded by all kinds of attacks, surrounded on every side, threats everywhere, but it won't touch you. Why? You're under the protection of his wings. Isn't that awesome? You're surrounded by the fortress of God. So I want to ask you this morning, is your God big enough to protect you? Is he big enough to protect you and your family? Is he big enough to protect you, your family, and your church family? All at the same time, right? So I want you to get this, because I've had people try to talk me out of believing that God can do anything. I really have. Christians, well-meaning Christians. But what they do is they try to reduce him down to their level. But here's what we have to understand. If we believe small, we will receive small. It's all in your perception. How big is your God? So when I read Psalm 91, I believe every single promise in here is for me. That's what I want you to do, is my God can do anything but fail, right? He can do anything. My relationship with Jesus now has positioned me to receive from my Heavenly Father. So all these promises are mine, not because I was a good little boy last week and I followed all the rules. I made God proud. They're mine because of my position in Christ. Touch three people, tell them, I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. I want you to get this. This is what qualifies you. This is what qualifies you for Psalm 91. Your position, you're in Christ. Say it again, say, I'm in Christ. When you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you were positioned. Now, when I understand that and truly believe it, I can fully receive every promise in this book. Not because of me and what I've done. It's because I'm in Christ. Say it again, I'm in Christ. My position grants me access to the things of God. But here's the key. I have to want them. Every believer is on their way to heaven. Every Christian's on their way to heaven. But not every believer spends time in the secret place. This is for mature believers. Are you doing all right? I just want to ask you, don't answer out loud. Are you just happy with going to heaven? Or do you want to see heaven come to earth? Do you want to see signs, wonders, and miracles come here? Are you content with what you have, or do you want more from God? This series of sermons is an invitation into intimacy like we've never experienced before. And I believe God is calling all of us into the secret place to know him. He's calling us into encounter, into intimacy, to experience him. And you and I have been positioned. But some levels of encounter have to be sought out. And this is where I want to speak to a hungry church, okay? I'm almost finished. You and I have been positioned, but some levels of encounter we have to seek out for ourselves. In other words, when you get saved, you're on your way to heaven. I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. That's where a lot of Christians stop. They really do. They're happy. They're content. I'm going to heaven. But God is calling everybody here at Freedom into the secret place, and he says, I want to get to know you, and I want you to get to know me more than you've ever experienced before. I want to show you that I can heal. I want to show you that I can deliver, that I can set free, that I can change your family. I can save your entire family and get them in that row with you. He said, but that, that stuff is found in the secret place. Hunger draws. If you're just content with going to heaven, this isn't for you. Are you catching this? There are some things that we have to search for. Why doesn't God show up powerfully in a dry church? They're not hungry. I'm not putting anybody down, but you don't hear of healings in a dry church. They just go and during worship, they just sit there and stare. They're not hungry. So God's not going to force himself. I'm coming to church today. Open the doors. You know when he does that? To a group of people who are hungry and say, God, I just want more. And I'm going to sing today and I'm going to worship today. Amen? Amen. Some things are only found by seeking. So what did he tell us? Ask, seek, and knock. Ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. This level of of intimacy and encounter is for people who are hungry for more. I believe we have a church who's hungry for more. Amen? How many want more of God? Amen. All right, go ahead and stand to your feet. Go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. We'll talk to the Lord just for a moment and then we'll take communion. Thank you, Lord. He's calling us into the secret place today.
for the last couple of weeks. He says, I want to get to know you. And I want you to get to know me. So you don't know me just from a sermon you heard on Sunday, but you know me for yourself. So that I can talk to you every single day. He wants to be number one in your life. He wants that level of intimacy and encounter we've been talking about. That's what he wants. I want you, for, just from your heart to his, I can't tell you the words to say, but if you, if you receive this today in the last couple of weeks, this is the way I would say it. I want you from your heart, just talk to him, not out loud, just you can do it quietly. Just say, Lord, I'm hungry for more of you. God, I want more of you. Lord, I want to go every single minute of every day talking to you. I want to be so close, so close to you that I can feel your breath upon my face. God, I want to know what pleases you. I want to know what makes you smile. You ever do things that, to make your family laugh? Sometimes I do. <laughs> Julie's laughing right now because she gets to see the dork at home. <laughs> but you know you can have such a relationship with God that you can make him smile. I want you to think about the relationships we have here on earth. That's what he wants to have with you. Is he wants to be so close to you. Julie and I can finish each other's sentences sometimes. That's what he wants. He knows you better than you know yourself. But he wants you to know him. So it's not so much that God's getting to know me as much as I'm getting to know him. And Heavenly Father, I want to know how you think. Because your thoughts are so much higher than my thoughts. That's what it says in Isaiah. His thoughts are way higher. So Lord, I want... Your word says that I have the mind of Christ. So, Lord, I'm asking that you would help develop that mind. I want to know how you think. I want to know how you see things so that when I come out of the secret place, I'm coming out seeing with spiritual eyes. So maybe the problem at work really isn't, uh, that isn't the problem. There's a deeper issue that I never saw before, but because I've been in the secret place, now I can see what's going on. And now I know how to pray for that person. They're really not angry at me. They have a terrible home life, but when they come to work, they take it out on me. So now when I know that, and you're beginning to show me the things that are going on in their life, I can pray to them, pray for them, but now minister to them. See how it works? This level of intimacy isn't just for us so that we can get high and say, oh man, I'm in the presence of the Lord, this is wonderful. As wonderful as it is, it's to lead and guide us throughout the, every day. To go to school with us, to go to work with us, to come home with us. The, the atmosphere in your home will change when you dwell in the secret place. Because that same level of presence and anointing that I feel in the secret place now gets on me. And I begin to carry that everywhere that I go. That's whenever we, we are, sometimes I close in prayer and I say the presence of the Lord is on the inside, but also resting upon us. This is the resting upon us. So that when Peter walked, his shadow falling across the sick healed them. The presence of the Lord was resting upon him. That's what we want to have. That only comes out of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Are you receiving this this morning? If you can feel it in your heart, God is calling to all of us. I want, to, I want you to get to know me. More than a sermon, more than a song. I want you to know me. And then our prayers change from, Lord, give me this, and I need you to do this, and I need you to do this by the 15th, and I need this done, to I just want to spend time with you. I just want to be close to you. That's what he's calling to us. He's calling to your heart. If you're here this morning and you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, now is the time to do it.
The Bible says if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that he is Lord, it says you shall be saved. Let's just say this together. Say, I believe. I believe. Lord, we believe. We thank you for all that you've done. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. You promised in Isaiah it will not return void, but will accomplish what you sent it forth to accomplish. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Amen.